So we're in Galatians chapter 2 this morning as we finish out Galatians chapter 2. We're continuing our Walking Your Freedom series where Paul has spent the first Galatians 1 and the first half of Galatians 2 just really calling out some Jews that were causing problems. He's defended himself. He defended the gospel. And this morning he finds himself in a situation where he's got to call out Peter. So it's a, little, it's a little dicey in the church for them this morning. But man, I love having people over for dinner. Like when I was a kid, my grandmother was one of those people, she comes from the old country, where, where you learn how to set the table. You know, the fork had to go on the left, the knife and the spoon on the right, the napkin, the cups, and everybody around the table had their cup on the right side, but because I was left-handed, she gave me the permission to put mine on the left side. <laughs> so I was an oddball on the table. So you looked across the dinner table, there was always a, the left-handed person thing, but for her, it was always a big deal, like family dinners and things like that. Like back in the day, everybody had family dinner and family dinner was so important. And it was around dinner, you discussed your day and what was going on in life. You heard, you heard grandpa talk about work and grandma share about her job and mom, dad, whoever. And anybody love family dinners? That's one thing I love about living in West Virginia. Some of you guys, you have family dinners. You guys meet every month or so often. You, you tear up the fellowship hall and you have dinner and you make a mess and we love it. And, but no, I'm joking. You guys do a great job cleaning up. But I love to see you guys celebrating family dinners. You know, family dinners look different in each home, doesn't it? So when we were growing up, grandma was all formal where everything stayed in the kitchen and she served you your food as you went to sit down. So she dictated what portions you got, what you got, and all that kind of stuff. And you go sit around the table because she wanted the table nice and clean because there, there was always a centerpiece and that kind of stuff. And when I got with Rami um, 29 years ago today, amen, um, her family were the opposite. Her family, everything went to the table, and you just dug in as you're eating around the table. So there was, there was nothing formal about it. It was like everything made it to the table, and you just eat the way you want. And there was, you know, there was no place settings and all that kind of stuff. It was like, let's just eat and go for it. And that's actually how we do it. So we're not as formal as my grandmother was, but we actually just toss everything on the table, and you help yourself. So if you have dinner with us, you know that. When Rami and I got saved, we got saved in a church in Chicago, um, also 29 years ago this past July. Um, amen. <laughs> And we got saved in that church, and that was a church of 8,000 people that represented the city, and it was a melting pot of people. So our small groups were not just white people. <laughs> I mean, we, had, we were in part of a Hispanic group for a while. We had Indian, we had Asian, we had Italian. I mean, Chicago's divided up by neighborhoods by ethnicity. So your groups that you'd be part of and wherever you were leading would be any number of different people. Well, what we learned quickly is depending on what group of people you're with, they eat dinner very differently. Some of them, like, like our Italian friends, it was like a four-course meal. You start out with your bread, and you start out with your appetizer and so on, and you work your way through a salad and maybe some soup, and then you work your way through a meal, and then there's dessert and so on, and that's all formal. Whereas more of our Hispanic friends, like Rami's family, it's not so formal. It's like everybody brings something. It's like a potluck and throw together. Some of, our, some of our friends would be the kind of people, if you were Indian or more traditional or more old world, dinner was very serious, and no matter what they put on in front of you, you had to eat. Well, there is some things in some of those nationalities that... I don't know what they're called. <laughs> you know, somebody puts something in front of you, you're like, what is that? And they tell you, you're like, I don't know if I want to eat that. <laughs> but you kind of have to, because if you don't, it's kind of disrespectful, right? And you, know, you don't want to be disrespectful. So I mastered the trick of putting it up and letting it fall down to the dog real quick. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure people did that in my cooking over the years, too. <laughs> but dinner is, is such a special time. And, you know, we saw in Acts chapter 2 that the early disciples, one of the key things that defined them as a church is they had meals together. One thing I love about New Beginnings here is I love our, our every other month potluck that we're doing. You know, this coming Christmas, we're going to host a holiday dinner together. We're going to have a holiday dinner here at the church. Turkey, the whole fixings, and the whole nine yards. That'll be sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas. We're, we're even going to do a white elephant gift exchange where we're going to ask you to wrap the weirdest thing you've got in your house and give it away as a gift. And we might actually bid on those things. So you might end up paying $50 for a roll of toilet paper or something. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I've done that before. I paid an extreme amount of money for a can of chip, chicken soup one year. So chicken soup. But meals together are so incredible. And this is where we find the disciples this morning. They're having a meal together between the Jews and the Gentiles and the apostles. And yet something goes wrong at this meal. So turn with me to Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 to 21. Our scripture says this. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face 
and he st- because he stood condemned. And before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how are you to force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because the works of the law, no one will be justified. But but in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners in Christ. Then a servant, is Christ a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For, For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. What an opening statement here. Because Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is Peter, it's his Jewish name. I opposed him to his face, Paul says. So Peter shows up in Antioch, and, and Antioch is the northern city of Jerusalem. And Antioch is actually one of the very first places the Christian church was planted. This is the very first city outside of Jerusalem that the Jews and the Gentiles were meeting together to form what would be the church. So you got, Christ, you got Jews and Gentiles coming together. They're sitting around the dinner table, just like Acts chapter 2 said. They're breaking bread. They're having fellowship. They're, they're having a meal together. Peter's actually sitting with the Gentiles, which is something Jewish people, we talked about last week, would not do because they view the Jews as unclean. So Jewish people and Gentile people didn't normally share a meal together. But Jesus Christ destroys all lines and boundaries. Amen? So Peter's having dinner with them. And everything seems to be going really well up to that point. But then all of a sudden, some of those Jews from the circumcision party, some of those Jews that have been giving Paul a hard time, they kind of show up. And what does Peter do? Peter kind of withdraws from the Gentiles and starts hanging around with his Jewish brothers. And Paul says, you acted like a hypocrite. Can you imagine somebody come, you walk to church this morning, you come in church, and I had to oppose you to your face and call you a hypocrite first thing in the morning? How would you feel? You'd be like, whoa, what did I do? At first look, we look at this, and we're like, well, what's the big deal? He was having dinner with them. He drew himself back. You know, what's the big deal? But the thing is, is what caused his hypocrisy is Peter was afraid of the circumcision party. He was afraid of them. And Peter allowed his Jewishness, if that's the word, or I'm going to probably correct me later, Jewishness, to come before his Christianness. He, before Christ, he decided his heritage. He decided that he better put on face he better, he better put on his face. He better kind of save himself. He's kind of acting two-sided in a way that he wants to, he, he's sitting with the Gentiles because he knows what Jesus taught. He knows what's right, but he also doesn't want to have the battle with the Jews. So he withdraws himself and he acts hypocritically. Have you ever met somebody that's two-faced like that? That one minute they're like, they're your friend and then behind their back, not so much. You ever have one of those people that shake your hand and smile on your face and in the background they're trying to kick you in the tail? You know, there's, there's, there's lots of people like that. But Peter's dealing with racial pride here because ever since he was a child, all Jewish people have been taught that Gentiles are unclean. They were taught that they were supposed to stay away from them. They have nothing to do with them. To not share a meal with them and and not, you know, so, so he's dealing with not only a national pride, he's dealing with a racial pride and he's dealing with some fear because he doesn't want to have the problem. You know, I do believe there's times in our life where we know the good we ought to do, but because it might cause us a problem, we hold back. Ever in that moment where you were supposed to do something, and maybe you're supposed to do something bold for Jesus, like show your faith, but you're afraid of what people are going to say, so you hold back. I think there's times in our lives as Christians where, where we should act like a Christian around others, but because we don't want our co-workers, or our friends, or our family to view us as a Jesus freak, we hold back. And we can and find ourselves acting more like the people around us than the Jesus we claim to serve. 
I think that's perfectly normal. I think if you look at the last election season, what happened? So many Christians lost their witness over Trump, over Biden, over politics, over Democrat, Republican, whatever. They're, they're choosing their racial pride, their national pride and all this stuff. And they were choosing that stuff over Jesus because Jesus calls us to unity. See, Jesus breaks all racial, all national. He breaks down all those lines. And in Christ, we should be one in Christ Jesus. I should look at my brother, Andrew, who's different than I am and still love him and want to serve him and have a meal with him versus looking at our differences. But this wasn't the case here. So Paul's upset with this. And Paul says, you know what? This is, this is a gospel issue. This is a big deal because this is the beginning of the church. And these guys, these two groups of people are trying to work out their differences. They're trying to figure out how to get along. They're trying to learn how to live together. They're trying to learn how to be the church. And you can't be the church if you're divided. I can't say, you know, up here is the Michigan person, you West Virginia people. I can't hang out with you. Not from around here, right? That wouldn't be right, right? That'd be horrible. Thank God that was the case. Because when I was coming down here, some people told Rami and I, we're planting new beginnings. They said, you know, those people in West Virginia might take a while to warm up to you. Praise God that's not the case. We love you guys. You love us back. It's been awesome. But there is those divides in people. And here's the deal with Peter is Peter should have knew better. See, a little earlier in Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision one day on a rooftop. Acts chapter 10, verses 19 through 16 says this. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry, and he wanted something to eat. And while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. He saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by the four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals, reptiles, birds of the air. And there came a voice to him saying, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And a voice came down to him again in a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and the thing that was taken up into heaven. This is when Peter was about to meet a man named Cornelius. Peter was about to lead his first Gentile to Christ, his first Gentile family. And God shows him a vision to say, don't you call anything that I've created unclean or common. See, God was changing things because, yes, they grew up learning that they were, the Gentiles were unclean and so on, but God had a purpose all along. God had something new you want to do. And it says this in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. This is the lesson Peter learned. So Peter opens his mouth. So when Peter gets down around the people, he says, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. That's the lesson Peter learned before this dinner ever took place. So this is why Paul's kind of upset, because Paul's like, you're an apostle of Christ. You should know better. That's not the way we should act. That's not the way we should treat people. We have to remember that walking in freedom means we treat all people the same. That with the same value and worth that God affords us, we don't judge the way the world does, because the gospel comes first. In this church, all people, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter what's going on in your life, you are loved. You're welcome because Christ Jesus welcomes you. We don't stand at the door down there and ask you what you're into and what you're part of and where you come from and all that kind of stuff and then decide where you can sit, you know, sinners in the front row, save people in the back and all that kind of stuff. We we just don't do that kind of stuff. And here you're welcome around the dinner table because Jesus welcomes you and that's our job to welcome you. So Peter had a lesson to learn here. What Peter did was wrong and what he did was hypocritical and what he did led some people astray. But see, Paul has an answer here. So in, going back to Galatians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, and the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray. Now, Barnabas was a new brother in Christ that Paul brought to Jerusalem to show what was going on. But when he saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though, like a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Peter himself wasn't even living like a Jew. He was living like a vagabond. He was going town to town and not with anything with him. He was living a Gentile kind of life. So, so it should have been more comfortable for him to stay around the table than to go around the religious league. But as I said, sometimes when you're trying to save face, you do things that don't make any sense. So Paul calls Peter out. And what he says is, he says, man, you, your conduct is not in step with the gospel. And what that in step means is you're not walking straight. Peter, in that moment, you started walking crooked. And you let your Jewishness become before what was right before God and right before men. Sometimes we have to challenge somebody in the church. You know, church discipline is never easy. 
It is not my favorite thing when I have to sit somebody down and discipline them because Andrew did something wrong and we got to have a talk again. <laughs> Joking. But the Bible says we have to correct, rebuke, and encourage. There's times that people need to be rebuked. There's times they need to be corrected. There's times they need to be encouraged, and that's our job. And sometimes I have to sit somebody down and point out their hypocrisy and their sin because that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's never easy, and most people don't like that, and you want to get some hating on the pastor going on, let me call out your sin and see how you feel about it. (laughs) But the truth is, sometimes church discipline is necessary. But here's the thing. The gospel has vast implications for us all. We're supposed to walk in step with the gospel, which means in line with the gospel. The gospel should mean so much to our lives that we should understand it. Our lives should go in the thrust of it, the direction of it, where Christ is going, we're going. Our job is to realign our lives to the gospel so that our lives match up with the truth of who Jesus is. Our, our lives should look more like Jesus than the world. The gospel truth is radically opposed to the assumptions of the world. But since we lived in the world, so many of us have embraced the worldly assumptions. We dress like the world, we talk like the world, we act like the world, and because we accept these things, following Jesus is not easy. But what happens is is our life needs to be realigned. See, when you accept Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, what you're saying is, Jesus, the way I've been doing things doesn't work. The way I've been going isn't working out for me. I've, I've made a mess of my life. I've fallen away, Lord, or I've never met you. Lord, it's not going straight. And when you give your life to Jesus, you have to bring your life into alignment with him, which means you're supposed to follow him. So as Jesus walks straight towards the cross and the Father, that's the direction you're supposed to go. But so many of us get sidestepped. You know, a couple months ago, we needed new tires on the Jeep. Now, we had just came back from Michigan, and we made it back safely. And the next morning, as Rami was getting up for work, we had a flat tire. We go over here to CK Auto, and they're going to fix the tire for us. And what they found is that we were so far out of alignment that the inside of our front tires was so worn, you could see the threads. And the guy said, you can't drive it like this. You're, you're going to blow a tire and get in an accident. And we're like, we just drove hundreds of miles back home to visit our kids. What are you talking about? I bet the grace of God we made it. But our tires were so out of alignment that our tires were shot. They were completely blown. We had to buy new tires. Now, nobody likes to buy new tires, especially when it isn't time yet. But you know what? Our lives are like that. Our lives are just like those tires. When we're out of alignment with God, we wear ourselves out and damage our lives in any number of ways. Amen. What is it going on in your life this morning? Would you say that you're in alignment with God or are you in alignment with something else? Is your life going in the direction of Christ so that you're becoming more like Jesus? Or is your life in the direction of something you've created or something else going on? We, we cannot... And this is what Paul's getting here. You cannot say you follow Christ and then walk in a different direction than Christ. It don't work that way. It just does not. You cannot follow Christ and have a sinful lifestyle or a sinful attitude and say, I follow Jesus. It doesn't work that way. Paul would say, you're a hypocrite. So he would say, stop living hypocritically this morning and get your life in line. Do some repenting and do some turning around because life is just better when we walk straight with Jesus. Amen. It's so much better when I got those new tires on the car, and it's like, well, my wife's safe going to work now. I'm safe running errands. It feels so much better. Had I known those tires were shot like that, I wouldn't have been to Michigan that week. But the tires before then, I praise God for his safety. But you know what? We're not walking with Jesus, man. We can find ourselves in a mess. And you know, we're not walking with Jesus. Sometimes we treat other people in ways that are unworthy of the gospel, like unforgiving you know, one of the things in the church I think is the biggest problem in the church, and New Beginnings doesn't have this, but we have to be careful because it comes in all churches, it's this thing called cliques. Anybody know what a clique is? It's where you have your people, and you hang out with your people, and you don't talk to anybody else. You don't cross the aisle, you don't talk to people next to you, and so on. And we have to be careful of that here because we have two big families in the church. And sometimes families can get so used to hanging out with family that we forget to cross the aisle and hang out with somebody else. We have to be careful that we treat all people with the same value and worth that Christ Jesus treats us. That we're not like Peter, that we don't back up off the table and say, well, I'm going to talk to Earl in church, but I'm not going to have lunch with Earl outside of church. Or I'm going to hang out with Earl in church, but I'm not going to go sit down at the, the bench where he was watching pumpkins the other night hang out, which was actually a lot of fun. Like We went down to visit Earl, and Earl had this job where he had to watch the pumpkins for the um, farmer's market. 
It was pretty cool. So we're playing a ball game. So what do we do? We're in the concession stand. And we decide, we start coming up with ways that we're going to sneak around the trailer and we're going to steal some pumpkins from Earl. <laughs> and so, yes. So we got, now I didn't do it personally because I'm walking and stuff with the gospel from a pastor night, to be honest, right? So I'm just confessing this morning that I did not touch a pumpkin. But my daughter and Pat, on the other hand, went and got a pumpkin. <laughs> they brought it back to the concession stand, took pictures with it. We're going to put it on social, all this kind of stuff. And then they took it back to Earl and said, hey, Earl, how's it going? <laughs> But I gotta admit, Earl was on top of it, but he was watching every direction, and it was pretty fun. He said he had a, he had a great night doing that. I think it's cool that he's doing that, but it was kind of fun to walk up on Earl and say, "What you doing?" Like me and Jessica walk over at one point, and he's just sitting on the bench, and we walk and we just stand there like this, and we literally stood there for like 40 seconds. We turned around, and said, "What?" <laughs> and then we sat down, and we just hung out with him, and but. <laughs> But, you know, it's fun hanging out with your brothers and sisters outside of church. Even if it's doing something like that, it was fun sitting there with Earl scheming about pumpkins. Just like it's fun having dinner together and doing other things. And, and we have to remember that we're, we're meant to spend time together. But when we spend time with each other, we have to honor each other. We have to look at each other and say, man, Andrew is just as important as anybody else. I love all of you guys equally. Just like we love our kids. Life is better when we walk straight with Jesus. Now, God had a solution in this whole entire thing. We ourselves are Jews by birth. We're going to go back into Galatians 2, 15 to 21. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. We know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So that we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law. Because the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners in Christ, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. And the life I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Paul is saying this. This is summing up chapter 1 and chapter 2. The law taught them they were sinners. The law taught them that it was impossible to please God, that some ultimate sacrifice needed to take place. And what Paul is saying, the only way that you could try and get justified by God by living a good life. You, you could try and just be a really good person, and you, 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 just, you could try and just check off a list of good deeds and all this kind of stuff, but it's, not, it's always going to fall short because even though the law told them how to live and gave them things they could do, they could never fully live up to it because we're rebellious in nature. It's only in Jesus Christ do we find justification, do we find the God. And I, and I thought about this this week as I was wrapping up chapter 2. I thought... I just stopped and I had this worship moment where God said, it is so radically incredible to think that God looks at me and says, Bob, I know you're a sinner. I know you're rebellious. I know everything about you. I know how you lived your life before me. And yet, you know what I'm going to do? If you trust my plan for salvation and trust my son, I'm just going to forgive you. Just like that. No, 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 no Hail Marys and stuff that other churches do. I don't have to say 50 Hail Marys and our fathers to get saved. I don't have to have a checklist. I'm not, I'm not on probation like the law would do where, we'll, you know, God could say, let me see how you act for 60 days. And if you're good enough, we'll make a deal. Right? Some of us, we do that with our own families. I love you, but you got to do this first. We see, we see this in marriage all the time, the lie of the 50-50. Well, if you do your part, I'll do my part. That's not love. Agape love is, you know what? I've been married 29 years today. I have to do 100% and Rami does 100%. And that's 100% chasing Jesus. That's the only way you can be married 29 years and be as happy as we are is Jesus. What do you do? You get up on the day of your anniversary, you worship the Lord. Thank God. Here's another year. It's awesome. I get to love this woman. It has to realize that God gives us to this. And we can't squander it. If God's going to look at Andrew and say, man, Andrew, I know what a rebellious sinner you are, but because you trust my son, I'm just going to forgive you of everything just like that. That is so radically incredible. You talk about love. What if we love people around us the same way? 
What if when somebody did something wrong and they showed some repentance, we just said it's done? No record of wrongs, no bringing it up later, no repercussions, no punishment, no nothing. It's just done. What if the next time, I was telling this yesterday, you know, what if the next time Jessica does something that we disagree with, because it happens at times, and she says, I'm sorry, then I look at her the way God does, like, done. I'm not going to talk to you a week later about what you did last week. What if in my marriage I did the same thing? I, I, I loved the way God did, and when we did something wrong to each other, if we, if we repented to each other, we said, I'm done. No record of wrongs, never bringing it up again, just forgiveness. What if we did that with the people around us? Those people around you, they're hard to forgive. And they've said, they've, they've said will you forgive me? But you, you feel like you're above God because you've got that record of wrongs going on. Boy, let me tell you what you did last week and last year and last month. You know, let me tell you how wrong you are. Let me tell you how broken you are. Married couples this morning, if that's the way you're living, you're a hypocrite. Because you're not following Jesus. Because in your marriage, you've got to forgive you got to look at your spouse and say, if your spouse comes to you and says, will you forgive me? Then you should have the same attitude of Christ and say, done. I think if we had that kind of love for people, people would be drawn to Jesus pretty quickly. Amen. But see, I think as Christians, sometimes we fail with that kind of love. We, we have a hard time with that kind of love because when people wrong us, we feel like, well, i got to pay them back. i got to pay them. i got to get even. Who are you to tell me, Bob, I can't get even? Do you know what they did to me? I know what we did to Jesus, and God said, I forgive you. Amen. It's crazy, isn't it? Right. Paul's talking about justification for two chapters here, and we got to stop and think, this is incredible. This is why he's defending this so strongly, because he's saying, it doesn't matter what we've done. If we trust God and trust Jesus for our salvation and God's plan, we are just forgiven like that. Can I get an amen this morning? Amen. Anybody in the church been forgiven? I hope to God, you, if you have it, we're going to make a way for you to do that today. So it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus that forgives you. So Paul goes on to say, and he's talking about justification. He says, man, the, the law can't do it for us. You, you could try to follow the law, but it can't do it for us. But it's only in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, you're justified. I want you to know this morning. Our justification affords us transformation. You know, and there's a strong warning in verse 17 that Paul says, you can't squander this. You have to be in step with the gospel. We cannot claim Christ and then squander our justification to unrepented sin. That's hypocritical. If you're in this morning and you're in church and you're like, hey, brother, I'm a Christian, you know, and, and you're just in church talking to talk, but at home you're living in unrepented sin, man, you're just a hypocrite. You're lying. That's what the Bible says. You can't do that. Like, if you've been forgiven, you need to claim that. And that's what walking in freedom is. Walking in freedom is this, that if Christ Jesus has forgiven me, I get to walk like I'm forgiven. And if I walk like I'm forgiven, why would I want to give that back? Why would I want to go backwards? If God has set me free, then I'm free indeed, the scripture says. I don't want to walk backwards. I'm going to walk forward, which means I'm going to be in church thinking, I want more of you. Amen. The only way, Jesus, I'm going to walk this out is I want more of you. I need more, amen? We all need more. Paul says that Christ is not a servant to sin, amen? He says what's been torn down can't be rebuilt. This is the problem some of us have is, is on the cross, Jesus Christ, he tore down the strongholds. He, he tore down our addictions and our hurts and our hangups and whatever it is he wants to abolish and get rid of. And if it's done with Christ, it should be done with you. But some of us, we keep trying to put them things back together. We can't. You have to make a decision this morning, man, that if God is going to forgive me, then I want to walk in that forgiveness. That walking in freedom is, I'm not going backwards. I can't. So I'm going to do whatever it takes in my life to walk forward because our justification affords us transformation, amen? If we could earn our salvation by living a good life, then Jesus died for nothing. But because we couldn't save ourselves, Jesus died for everything. He died for everything. So Galatians 2.20 now, I know you see this on coffee cups and T-shirts and, and any number of other places. So don't, don't glance over this. Like I know how some of you are. Like I heard that before, Pastor. Now, listen to this this morning. For I have been crucified with Christ. How could Paul be crucified with Christ? He came years after it happened. How can we 2,000 years later be crucified with Christ? We weren't there in AD 33. Nobody's nailing me up to the cross, right? 
It's a unique statement, Paul saying, if I've been crucified with Christ, and what that means is this, is that, is that when I give my life to Jesus completely, I have to die to myself. I have to die to my sin. Those things get nailed to the cross. And this isn't, Paul's not talking symbolically. He's talking literally. He's saying this is really what happens. This is a supernatural act of God, that when you die to yourself, you die in Christ Jesus. Romans 6 says that if you die with Christ Jesus and you're buried in the waters of baptism, you are risen to a new life, which means if I have died with Christ, I'm risen to a new life, then it's no longer I who live. I is gone. I am not Bob anymore, right? I'm not Bob anymore. I'm a child of God. I'm not my former self. My former self has been crucified with Christ. And if I've been hung on the cross with Jesus and I've died to my old self, why in the world would I want to go back to that? Why? For it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live in the flesh. And I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If I could paraphrase Paul this morning, it says this. The law showed me that I could never make myself acceptable through it. So I stopped living to it. I died to it as my Savior. Though I obeyed it before God, I was simply to get something from him. It was for my own sake. Now I obey him simply to please him. I now live for him because in Christ Jesus, we die to ourselves and our old self has to die. What if I just picked up my cross this morning? I just made the decision that I've died to Christ. I am risen to a new life and I'm just going to start living that new life. I'm going to own it. I'm going to claim it. I'm going to put it on. I'm going to wear it. And I am just going to decide for myself this morning that I am not going backwards anymore. Because that doesn't work. How do we live this out? We got to realign our lives. Church, we have to realign our lives. If if there is something in your life that's taking you away from Christ Jesus, it's got to go. And you got to look at that thing like a dirty old pair of worn out tires that are trying to hurt you. If there's something in your life that's taking you away from Christ Jesus, it's got to go. If it's your thoughts, if it's your emotions, if it's your actions, if it's an addiction, a hurt, a hang up, a relationship, if there is something that's taking you away from Christ Jesus, it's not from God. It's got to go. I should get an amen in that one. You got to realign your life. Paul's saying Peter needed to realign his life. He needed to get in step. Are you walking inside with the gospel this morning? This means our heart, our minds, and our actions all begin to love like him, think like him, and act like him. When you align your life for Christ Jesus, you begin to think like him. You think if you're thinking like Jesus, you're going to have negative thoughts? If you're being led by the Holy Spirit, then you're going to root for negative thoughts. You start thinking like Jesus. What if you start acting like Jesus and then loved like him? We in church, we need to reel on our lives. Get in step with the gospel so that what we proclaim is the truth, what we live is the truth. Any area in our lives that are out of alignment needs to be repented of and brought into alignment with Christ. And here's the deal. I know that's hard. Amen? But God said, I've given you my spirit. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He sent the Holy Spirit to fill us with the power of the Holy Spirit. You're right. It's hard, but he could do so much more than we could do. Yes, See, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we could realign our lives. The Holy Spirit's like that wrecking pinion, like that machine. Ellen knows more about this than I do. You pull your, you're the car, you pull up in there, and he just does his thing. And he gets your mind, he starts realigning and setting it up, putting it on nice and straight, filling with his thoughts. He gets your heart, he adjusts the toe and the, and the whatever else they call it, the way cam, toe and camber of your heart a little bit. See, I'll get this sooner or later. He starts adjusting now, so in your heart, you start loving like him, and all of a sudden you start acting like him, which means when you're out and about in your relationships and in the world and everywhere else, what people see, as they stop seeing you, they start seeing Jesus. Who would benefit from that in here? A Christian person is somebody whom Christ now lives. Get that this morning. A Christian person is somebody whom Christ now lives. A Christian person isn't somebody who's trying to check off a good list and earn it, because he can't earn it. A Christian person is somebody who understands that God gives it to us freely. And because God is with us and Christ is with us, I've died to myself. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 
And it's in that strength I live every single day. So when my friends, my family, and everybody sees me, I want them to see Jesus, amen? Paul said, that's what Paul got with Peter. So he's so upset with Peter because the Gentiles and the Jews, to them, Peter was like Jesus because Peter walked to Jesus. He talked to Jesus. He ate with Jesus. For three years, Peter spent time with Jesus. So Peter, to the early disciples, was, was almost like a superhero. He was somebody they looked up to. Like he was a big deal. So when Peter acted hypocritically, that was also a really big deal. So Paul calls him out on it because Paul said, that's not the way to gospel. Church, I want you to know this morning, the way to gospel is you, you need to own it. You need to live it, amen? amen? And if you're not living it this morning, then over this next song we're going to sing, worship team, you can head back up. I want you to go to the altar this morning and just confess. Don't leave this church out of alignment and go limping down the street and limping through life. If you're not walking with, if you haven't been walking with Jesus and you've been sinning lately, you need to repent this morning. Because if Christ came back this afternoon, you don't want that conversation he's going to have with you. You need to repent. And you need to die to yourself. Maybe you've been struggling with some things in your life and, and this following Jesus has been hard. You need to die to yourself to say, let this be the day that you die. September 25th, 2020 is the, is 2022 is the day I died to myself. Because I want Christ to start living in me. I want my heart, my mind, and my actions to love like him, to act like him, to think like him. Because I understand that a Christian who's who I want to be is a person whom Christ now lives. He lives inside of you. This is what walking in freedom is all about. Walking in your freedom is this. Christ now lives inside of you. And if Christ lives inside of you, then man, you could do, uh, you could do amazing things. Jesus himself said, greater things are you going to do. If Christ is living inside of you, you have every power to overcome sin, to overcome temptation, to overcome addiction and brokenness, or whatever it is. Jesus Christ living inside of you is enough to heal you and set you straight on that straight path. He will realign your life if you just ask him for it. Lord, realign my life. I'm out of alignment. But you know, when you ask him for it and he does it, then you got to start walking in it. You know, you get that pep in your step, right? <laughs> you get happy. I've been forgiven. I'm happy. I've been set free. I'm happy. Next time temptation comes and hits, you look at that temptation, you say, I've been set free. Next time you're tempted to do something that's not Christ-like, you look in the mirror and you imagine Jesus standing there. Next time you're threatened to talk to somebody or do something that's unbecoming of a Christian, just remember Jesus is with you. See, sometimes I think that if we could see him in the room, we'd be different. He is in the room. My Bible did not Jesus promise, hello, I'm always with you. Always. Every step, of he's always with us. So I can walk with him. And that's what walking in freedom is all about. I get to walk with Jesus. This is why this was such. This is why chapter one and such, chapter two was such a big deal to Paul. He's looking at these Judaizers and they're telling them they need religion, they need this and that. And Paul's like, "You only need Jesus." Amen. I'm ask Tom to come forward this morning. I'm ask um, Andrew to come forward this morning. These brothers are going to be standing up here at the altar this morning. Whether you need anointing, whether you need prayer. Whether you need confession, don't be afraid. Look, I'm telling you something. Peter was afraid of what people thought of him, and that got him in trouble. Don't do that in the church. If, if you need the altar this morning, you run up here. Because you know what? The only person you need to worry about is what Jesus thinks. So don't be one of those people like, oh, I'm a little, I don't want to go up there because people are going to know. Who cares? You run up here, man. You take care of your business, amen?